Hi everyone, uh, I'm the Associate Data Scientist in the labs in Singapore and today I'll be walking you through what we did in Knowledge Graphs uh, for uh, over the last couple of months. So first of all, of course, as with any data science problem, we're, we need to start with the problem itself. And what we realized was that in infrastructure investing, uh, so by infrastructure, I mean all the projects that relate to uh, highways or dams and things like that, uh, all of those projects face a $32 trillion uh, investment gap between now and 2035, according to a McKinsey report in 2017. Uh, that's a huge investment gap. And even though private equity as a whole is uh, is huge right now and uh, there's so much dry powder in the markets, a lot of that capital is not really finding its way into infrastructure projects. And part of that is because there just isn't the data available for them to make informed investment decisions uh, into the places that really need them. So what we did was to identify this as its problem, right? Fundamentally, data transparency is the key barrier to infrastructure investing. Now, as for Finitive, we don't have, a, or we didn't have at the time, a specific infrastructure proposition. But what we did have was a lot of data that could be applicable to an infrastructure investor. It just needed to be, uh, it just needed to be combined together in a useful way to them. So, for example, we had project-related data, financing data like bonds and loans that are typically used to finance an infrastructure project, as well as news related to it, other loans data, and of course ESG data that's seminal to actually assessing the sustainability risk of an infrastructure project. Now, when we put all of our project data together from our global project finance database from the Middle East and North African regions, as well as the projects in the Belt and Road Initiative, we realized that we truly had a global infrastructure database with over 60,000 infrastructure projects, which is much better than what exists on the market today. And uh, since all of those databases existed in uh, disparate sources, we tried to prioritize which ones to link first. And uh, after some conversations with customers and internal subject matter experts, uh, we found out that the priority was really to link the project-related data with financing data, because that's where the biggest gaps really are. With something like news, you're able to piece that together uh, by just doing your due diligence on a project. But sometimes it's really obscure to understand your exposure to certain kinds of monetary, financial, or project-related risks. So all of these databases existed, but they weren't custom built to serve an infrastructure value proposition. Not only that, they weren't even custom built to serve each other necessarily. So we first had to figure out how to link all of these databases together. When we did, we used the existing fields and uh, tables that existed in these databases and realized that the process was just incredibly complex. Uh, as you can see on the screen there, uh, the different steps that we had to use to wrangle the data together uh, really did not uh, really did not lend itself well to something that was easily uh, maintainable. And as Ben was saying, this is this is both an advantage and a drawback of your traditional relational database. You're able to actually look at um, you're able to look at the data really quickly, and you have high performance, but it's not really easy to be flexible with it. So we realized that aggregating using the existing data was incomplete because it didn't allow us to leverage all of the data across all of these databases. So we went back to the clients and subject matter experts to prioritize which tables were actually necessary to them. And then, of course, what we did was, after looking into the data, we realized that there's a lot of assets that had unstructured data that wasn't actually being captured by the fields themselves. So the data model hadn't actually evolved to, to capture everything that the content analysts themselves were picking up when they were you know, reading the data into the databases or manually entering it, for example, or when it was being automatically scraped into the database. So what we did was we looked at all of these comments and unstructured data, text data that we had, and we did a named entity recognition on it to pull out all of the entities and then checked if that entity had a perm ID. Now, a perm ID is, uh, is a unique identifier. And using that, we were able to pull in all of Refinitiv's associated data on that particular entity into our knowledge graph. Uh, and as long as something has a perm ID, that means it has other metadata regarding its financing, its jurisdiction, its region, sector, so on and so forth. And so we were able to populate our project-related data and our entity um, and our financing data with all of this entity data as well. So just to illustrate what exactly that looks like, uh, when you uh, think about it, this is an implicit linking method because you're kind of implicitly going through the textual fields that exist in the data. Uh, we were now able to link projects across databases. So even though they didn't actually talk to each other, they didn't actually necessarily have common IDs, 
now through the entities that were involved in the project, we were able to link these different products together. Why is that valuable? That's valuable because you're now able to see all of the data that exists in these different databases without losing anything uh, and without a need to deduplicate the data set when you eventually rewrite the data model. Not only that, you're now able to see how people uh, actually evaluate counterparty risk. So because now you can see the different ways in which they're all linked together. Now to just compare the two methods, let me show you uh, what that breakdown actually looks like. Uh, using, the implicit, uh, using the implicit linking method, which you see in blue, we got 550% more projects and entities identified. Uh, in gray, you see the original explicit linking method, you know, using the existing fields. And you can really see that by using the knowledge graph method, by, by pulling out all of these entities and then linking them together uh, with whatever information was already there in the knowledge graph, we were able to come up with a much richer and a much more context heavy data set that's then a lot more useful to an infrastructure investor. Now, why is that actually valuable? On the screen right now, you see uh, the Belt and Road Initiative that's present in Workspace. Uh, and with that, uh, we were able to incorporate all of its content coverage, uh, its core functionality. And by talking to customers, we were able to kind of pinpoint and identify what about what already existed was most valuable to them and what else they really wanted to see. And so what did we actually have at present, right? At the time, we just had this project data where you could see each individual project's participants, finances, and project details. And what do I mean by details? I just mean that you can see the type of project or its project history. But what's really valuable is being able to see the relationships of these project participants, so the financial managers or contractors and so on and so forth. But more importantly, you want to see what they're exposed to as well, so you understand your own risk. And so we were able to then highlight with the knowledge graph method uh, the different projects that they were involved in, as well as the related deals of those projects as well. Under finances, we were now able to see the project value across all of these projects, uh, and also the bonds and syndicated loans that were used to finance them. So here's an overview of what our architecture actually looks like. Uh, so we combine these six databases together to get the, this project entity and financing data that all came together in uh, entrable files. Uh, so in an RDF graph, as Ben alluded to earlier, that we then wrapped in an API. And today that can be uh, that can be distributed, searched, and queried by a customer, which is which is fantastic. So what can uh, what can you actually take away from this particular event? Graphs are great in finance because they're bringing together these disparate sources of data, and they're a lot easier to scale because of their flexible schemas. Um, because of their uh, flexibility, you're able to create better features, and also that can lend itself well to better analytics. So graph analytics, like centrality scoring algorithms, um, are, are are much more uh, are are much more advanced in the way they actually comprehend that data and lend themselves well to uh, fraud and compliance use cases as well. Uh, one way that you can explore the data today is by using uh, Refinda's data exploration tool, uh, which uh, which was created by data scientists, as it says, uh, for, for data scientists. It's a collection of notebooks on the cloud, uh, and it's free and available for, for anyone to access. So let us know if you'd, if you'd like to take a look. And thank you so much for your time today.